Welcome to the fourth edition of Kerala Literature Festival, sir. Uh, once again, welcome Madhavanar sir and uh, to Rageesh Sharma to the session. We have a beautiful function here. This is uh, today is Rageesh Sharma's 70th birthday. So we wanted him on that particular day, and I'm glad that he came on that particular day. Thanks to Madhavanar sir also for that. And uh, happy birthday, many, many returns of the day, sir. And we are really privileged to have you. And may I request you to cut the cake along with Madhavanar sir. I want to thank all of you for making this such a memorable day. Thank you very much for this thoughtful gesture. It has been more than sweet. Thank you very much. And we are happy to be here with you all today. Sri Revi, Wing Commander Raghesh Sharma, distinguished guests, <clears throat> my dear friends, it's a very, very unique day for all of us. It's a, a strange coincidence that happens to be the birthday of uh, Sri Rajesh, and he could celebrate in this historic city of Calicut. Uh, his family also is here, so I wish all of you uh, a very long life and uh, very happy and productive life ahead. <clears throat> well, indeed, I think uh, uh, when D.C. Revi told me that uh, there is going to be a literature function, a, a festival here, I was wondering what the space has to do in the, this event. But after seeing this crowd here, I am more than impressed that uh, the, the not only literature, the science and technology also attracts uh, the attention of the people. Uh, I can see a lot of young faces, so that's a good sign. We are looking for a lot of young faces to venture into the realm of science and to take up the challenges for the future. Well, I think today our discussion will be primarily focused on the space-related activities. And uh, we are extremely happy that a national hero and a pioneer uh, who has traveled to the space and lived there for seven days and returned back to Earth. And normally you know that uh, the space uh, journey conditions a human body in a much better way that itself will add to the health and strength of uh, Sri Dagi. Okay. Now, uh, you know that uh, India, as far as India is concerned, today we are in a turning point as far as the space program. Uh, Prime Minister has recently announced that uh, we must be doing the manned space mission as quickly as possible. And he has set a deadline of 2022. It's going to be a real challenge to achieve this. We have the huge rockets, which is required for carrying a manned capsule to space. That is the GSLV Mark III, which has been recently flight tested, uh, that can be got ready for that mission. But the major challenge is going to be in making a livable capsule uh, withstanding the environment of the space to start with, and also the severe conditions during the launch phase, and again, the severe conditions of re-entry and recovery. So there are going to be a host of technological challenges ahead of us, and I'm sure the country will be able to take up that and achieve the, the goal set by our national leader, uh, Prime Minister Modi ji. Now, <coughs> looking back <coughs> to history, India had a great start in the space program. Uh, about 20 years later, compared to the USSR or the USA, 
they were <coughs> converting the military rockets for the space exploration, so on. Though we have had a start 20 years later, today we have caught up with the, uh, the other developed nation in the space arena, and we are in par with the technological capabilities compared to Russia, Europe, China, Japan, uh, these countries. So we, so we can say that uh, we are one of the major players in the space arena, and uh, certainly it is going to be the future uh, for many of the Indian scientists and technologies, and uh, certainly the space benefits have to be used for the benefit of the common man. Well, I will dwell on it maybe slightly later. Before getting into that, uh, 1980s, that is a time when uh, we were building satellites, taking to Russia and flying it. The, our first remote sensing satellite, Aryabhata, and later Paskara, they were launched like that. Similarly, for our communication purposes, Intelsat satellites were built in USA and launched with the US launch vehicle. That's the time frame in which the erstwhile USSR came forward uh, with an uh, extra hand for cooperation, space cooperation. And at the time, uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhiji was the chair, and uh, she has taken a bold decision to have the program, uh, to have our Indian astronaut flying in space. Uh, I would request uh, Rakesh to elaborate on that a little bit more. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> if I may take a minute away and get rid of my jacket, there's climate change happening inside the jacket. <laughs> it's near the beach. It should not lead to a tsunami. Yes, so uh, as you had just mentioned that uh, the Indo-Soviet uh, space flight, the Soviets at that time, it was not Russia, it was the Soviet Union, and uh, they had offered this flight uh, to Mrs. Gandhi, and uh, you, you perhaps know much better than I do what the background communications and discussions were, but uh, I was quite happy to... Uh, be the beneficiary, so to speak, of that initiative. And uh, uh, really speaking, uh, I think it was an offer which uh, was made well before its time, primarily because India at that point did not have uh, a manned space program. And I think the reasons were more geopolitical than, uh, than uh, uh, Hindi, Rusi, Bhai Bhai. So it was more than that, and therefore, but having taken that, given the fact that Mrs. Gandhi and before her, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru had, uh, you know, an eye for uh, science and technology, and they thought that, that that was the way to bring up our nation and make it, put it on the fast lane, and I, it did serve that purpose. So her initiatives in atomic energy in uh, Antarctica and uh, space, the kind of funding which kept coming regularly without any disruption has really helped uh, our space industry. And today we are here. So the space flight as such, what it did was that it gave an opportunity for a whole lot of uh, youngsters in that generation, and I'm talking about 35 years ago, precisely 35 years ago, and um, it brought uh, the uh, technology of space beaming into the living rooms of at least those folks who owned a television at that time. My own family uh, had not owned a television at that time, so we later on saw uh, the VHS uh, tapes, but uh, I think the it, it did fire the imagination of uh, the youth, and uh, it gave a chance for our scientists to design uh, 
the experiments because here was a was an opportunity to uh, perform those experiments in microgravity so it was an opportunity which was very well utilized by isro and the, the scientific community the rdo was also involved in it and uh, and um, we designed those experiments and i performed them and the results came back and uh, this has this is how it all started and the training and all was done in in moscow and uh, i was i really benefited from that and i have some idea of how that training is uh, imparted um, well i think uh, whenever we talk about the astronaut rakesh uh, sharma sare jahan se acha that rings in our ears how did you get that tips to me i was i was i was given to speaking the truth <laughs> and and like every other uh, astronaut who first goes up into space the first thing astronauts do is they look out for their own country uh, which is exactly what i did and uh, i must let you know that it's only now that our country uh, from the uh, earth is beginning to look slightly better thanks to swachh bharat but uh, but from space the beauty of our nation is that we have a very long coastline so you can see the color difference between the land and the sea and the various shades of blue as you're approaching the shore and from there uh, when you go towards the northeast because that was the track of our a spaceship in orbit the salute you get to see the coastline and after some time the plains the deccan plateau which looked brown then you from the left window you can then see uh, rajasthan the deserts of rajasthan and while you, within a few seconds then you go up for the northeast and you see the indo gangetic plain which is absolutely green followed thereafter by the forests of assam with a deep green and then you see the himalayas laid out absolutely looking purple from space because the sunlight cannot get into those valleys and the snow capped mountains so our nation looks absolutely beautiful from space and uh, this is what i was conveying to mrs gandhi and through that program to the rest of the countrymen that we belong and we are blessed to belong to a country which has everything which has a coastline which has got there yeah, deserts which has got mountains and forests and and it's a wonderful sight well subsequently we had a, a lot of uh, remote sensing observations of space initially we had a remote sensing satellite ir series uh, which could hardly discern the objects about the 1 km diameter but uh, the technology has grown to such an extent today we have submeter class processing that means a small maruti car which is going on the road can be identified with the image which is taken of course it is just not for the photography or the thrill of it we want to put to use for the common man how to benefit them the agriculture is one area where we have served very well you know the areas where the proper cultivation has taken place how the growth is progressing whether there is any attack of pesticide pests or insects are happening and what is the proposed i mean expected yield from the status so such information is uh, become part of life of every villager today again coming to using this uh, observation pictures uh, the climate change of the planet uh, that's one major input derived out of it but most practical one is with respect to the disaster management you know the pictures take, taken from uh, 36000 kilometers away uh, they are about 50 60 meters resolution but that is sufficient to identify the cloud formation the cyclonic formation how they move about and what is the probability of it the land and which location may be with the cloud 20 meters so this information is uh, broadcast 
in advance to the people, the district people, other the villagers, and the warning is taken by them, and they get evacuated to safer location. So, in the case of a cyclone and heavy rainfall, etc., this has become a very, very powerful tool. The earth observation system, satellites used, and uh, also the communication, instantaneously connecting the entire country to the satellite. So, this has been put to use on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, uh, talking about these images and this reaction, I remember uh, when we conceived the Chandrayaan mission, you know, we were on the ground, but still we wanted to go to moon. And uh, Prime Minister Adal Bihari Vajpayee was uh, Prime Minister at the time, we made this proposal, and uh, we very patiently listened and uh, more or less agreed for the proposal. Then in a public function like this, he was addressing the people. He said, uh, Madhavan, uh, it is a good idea to go to the moon. But, uh, you know, from here it looks so beautiful and pleasant and even beautiful women's face are compared with the moon, etc. But once you go near that, I don't know what you will say, but it is true. When we went near, 100 kilometers nearby, and it is full of potholes and uh, uh, moles and whatnot. And seeing that picture, you will no more call your beloved uh, moon face. <laughs> so. That, that's the kind of experience we had. Uh, but, you know, these, these are some of the adventures we had. You know, okay, we, India is a leader in applying the space technology uh, for the common man and day-to-day uh, -day life. Every walk of life today is affected by one element or other of the space. I talked about the disaster management, DTH, what you are getting, the way up the satellites are beaming hundreds of channels to your rooftop. Uh, then comes uh, the remote uh, communication, you know, villagers. They are not having any communication means. Even today, about 35,000 villagers are not having any means of communication. Those are reached out through the satellite. So like that, plenty of applications. But keeping all those things in mind, still ISRO has been spending a little bit of efforts in understanding the science. And the moon mission is one of that. And uh, I am very happy to say that our Indian uh, spacecraft, when it was going around the moon and taking the images, for the first time we could announce to the world there is water on the surface of the moon. So this is a fantastic achievement. You know, uh, just uh, looking back, American astronauts, they brought some samples from the moon and it was analyzed in the NASA laboratory little bit of traces of uh, water they could see. But you know, somebody brushed it aside. No, 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 it must be sweat from the astronaut's hand. <laughs> but we, we had the fortune uh, or the fortune, uh, luck to go. That again an accident. You know, the instrument was designed to look at the minerals which is on the surface of the moon. But the, the manufacturer who made the sensor, it is slightly wider range and it could look at uh, way lower uh, uh, atomic number elements like water and so on. That was not intended for us. But when it went there, that became handy. That is a sensor which picked up the presence of water on the moon. So sometimes accidents like in space happen. Now the human space flight, uh, we have now going in a big way. And there are two opinions. There are some people say, why do you want to waste so much of money? Uh, for the uh, such an expensive program and the risk involved is very high, etc. Why do you want to do it? Uh, would you like to comment on that? Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. Um, whenever I've uh, addressed audiences, whether mostly actually from the media, these questions always come up as to whether a poor country like ours can afford to spend so many uh, crores of rupees for an activity which essentially is only to raise the prestige of the nation. But I think they are not looking at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture really is, ideas, the question is not to ask whether this money is well spent, whether these investments are justified. I think what we need to see really is what is the return on that investment. As Dr. Madhavan Nair has just mentioned that there is hardly any facet of an Indian citizen's life that has not been touched 
by ISRO's technology, whether it is tele-education, whether it's telemedicine, whether it is remote sensing, which gives us all the data required for nation national development. So we really need to look at that, at what are we getting out of this uh, particular expenditure, the return on investment. And I think up till now, ISRO, unlike the other countries, they have ne we have never ever uh, gone ahead for the sake of just national prestige. We've always, at the end of it, had an aim where the benefits of that technology filter down to the common man. And well, I think that this is a path which ISRO will continue to follow, even when it comes to deep space exploration. And uh, what we really now need to think about is that the assets which we are going to get from this kind of exploration, whether from the moon or from Mars, what is going to be the end use? How are we going to utilize those assets? Are we going to go the same way like we have done in Antarctica? Are we going to draw lines that this piece of land belongs to my country and whatever I get from here, it will go only to my country? I think we, here is a window of opportunity which we must grasp, grab, and see how we can change the way we live. That activity in future is, should be really for the greater good of humanity rather than one or the other country. Otherwise, what we are going to do is draw the same boundaries on the moon and Mars, and what we will succeed in achieving is to export conflict into outer space. Star Wars will then truly become a reality. And it is, it is a reality which we really should not ho hope to see in anybody's lifetime, not our own and not our children's lifetime. Yeah, that's true. Actually, you must have seen some advertisements uh, in some website, etc. Uh, offering land on the moon. But I must tell you, none of us can own specific piece of land on, uh, on the moon or Mars or anywhere. There is an international treaty which binds the nations and their responsibilities. And uh, there is a specific statement, the outer space, including the outer planets, should be used only for peaceful purposes. So that we will continue, I hope so. And uh, except there are some violations that do, will happen. And people will try to see the military angle and military potential and so on. Other day one child was asking me in a school, uh, can we uh, shoot a bomb from space? Well, imagination is good. Theoretically it is possible. But we will never do it. That is unethical. So we are bound by the peaceful application of outer space and we will do it. Uh, now, you know, one thing, uh, the space uh, we have, India especially, was concentrating mostly on planet Earth. And of course, a little bit on the moon and Mars. The moon, the second mission is going to go take off uh, maybe within a few months. That will have a unique feature of uh, having a lander. A robotic lander will be there. And it will, uh, uh, a platform will move around and pick up samples, analyze and send back the data. This is to confirm whatever remote sensing data we had, and that's going to be the logical step. Uh, now Mars, yes, we have sent a probe and taken very accurate pictures, and some uh, scientific data also has come. Why are we looking for all these things? Because we have the unanswered question. The whole universe, where it began, where it is, and where it is going. It is unanswered. I think 99% of the questions associated with that are not, uh, no, there is no answers. Now, observing from the ground, there are a lot of limitations. There are cloud covers, dust cover, and so on. So it distorts the signals which are coming from outer space, and we may not be able to have a close picture. So these platforms which are around the Earth uh, can have such images in the visible band or in the microwave 
or in the X-ray, gamma ray, and so on. So that is going to provide very valuable information about the galaxy, stellar constellation, black hole, so on. So this is searching for the fundamental truth: how all originated. So this is something the exploration which is in front of us. For that, the satellites moving around Earth is one thing. Then going to uh, suppose if we can uh, establish a permanent platform on moon, that can provide such an opportunity on a continuous basis. Then, uh, of course, uh, my guru, Dr. Kalam, he used to uh, quote some of the pessimists. Uh, they are asking the question, suppose something happens to planet Earth, where the humans will go? Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer. And, uh, you know, earlier you know, adventurous journey of uh, Columbus and all those things looking for new grounds and so on. Now going outward, the nearest is moon and the next is uh, Mars. Of course, Venus is there, but uh, that is extreme temperature and so on. So can we colonize uh, this area? What do you think about it? I think we must colonize. And, and why I say that, just to take up from Dr. Kalam's point that uh, what is going to happen, well, let's say tomorrow there are asteroids which are roaming around. Tomorrow if there is an asteroid hit and uh, the human genome, we have no backup. We are taking more care to backup our data on our computers, but the human genome has no backup. So it, we need to have another habitation so that if there is something cataclysmic which befalls our planet, then it should not write off the species. We must have an outpost. So that is one reason. But whether each country must rediscover the wheel, must gain its own expertise to be able to go and construct a habitation, I don't think that sh is how it should be done because the effort is humongous. It, I think, is beyond the capability of any one nation. So we all need to collaborate with our individual strengths and then go out there because it doesn't make sense, you know, tomorrow you're going to go to Mars and you're going so far away and once you land on Mars, you turn around and say that, you know, uh, I'm an Indian or I'm an American, it loses its meaning. We are going to be people from planet Earth. We're going to go as Earthlings and naturally, whatever we get out there should be for the greater good of humankind back on Earth. I think that's the vision we must work towards. That's really great. Uh, actually, I, 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 we have no option but to travel to the nearby planet and then see how best we can make habitats and so on. But the technological challenges involved in that, the expenditure involved, enormous. One nation by itself may not be able to take up all this load. So naturally, instead of uh, replicating the efforts, so we can have collaborative efforts with other nations to establish such uh, for the future. Uh, to give a small example, Today, even the biggest rocket which we have today, with that, if you want to take a meaningful tent on the Mars, about 25 missions are required. We have to send the loads of material, uh, equipment, technical equipment, and uh, the supplies, and so on. Mars, as you know, the moon, of course, is extremely difficult. There is a vacuum all around. Water, yes, they are available in plenty. Holes, but transported water holds it is going to be a difficult task. But still, every element which is required for human survival has to be carried from the ground. So that's again going to be expensive. In the Mars also, uh, the very thin atmosphere with carbon dioxide. With the carbon dioxide, you cannot live. So you have to separate oxygen from that. We have to carry equipment for that. Again, the temperature extremes, you know, something like plus 160 to minus 150. That's an extreme temperature. 
so how to make sure that the air conditioning and all is done properly so all these equipments has to be carried in the early missions then finally the supplies which is required for a few months again the fuel which is for uh, the travel back to earth all these are going to take okay so uh, such a, that means the first step is you should have much larger rocket than what we are having today uh, the us they have some program to make a uh, uh, 100 ton orbit on stroke and uh, today's newspaper many of you would have read this uh, spacex has come out with a rocket which can take off from here go to mars deliver goods and come back as uh, a great concept if they evolve like that yes step by step we are moving forward to the target but these technological challenges are very many so one has to really get equipped for that and we have to build up bit by bit and uh, things are not happening overnight uh, even the earliest uh, uh it touched down on the mars maybe 2030 or that kind of time frame and uh, of course with the pace at which it is going we should be able to par with others and contribute to such uh, planetary exploration programs as well now one thing uh, you know in all these areas india's uniqueness is the entire technology is home grown we did not get even a proper textbook on rocket or satellite from is our engineers would have gone and visited some of the laboratories i have seen something but that's all but to build from scratch to this level that is a human effort the innovation which is done by the indian scientists and engineers uh, certainly that is one area which uh, you know probably we are looking for the young generation the youth to come up and uh, take on the challenges for the future unfortunately there is a little bit of gap and uh, how to bridge this gap is something which is worrying us uh, first of all the uh, money which is coming from the industries like it or the management area and other things are huge so most of the bright youngsters they turn towards that not on fundamental sciences See, if you want to get into such field a strong foundation in science physics mathematics chemistry biology that is a must then engineering and related topics and how to use this knowledge to innovate and find new ways of doing things better efficient cost effective more reliable that type of designs has to evolve so such this is a very huge uh, gap in that area and the youngsters should come forward to take up these challenges uh, i don't know you have any suggestions to attract the youngsters to this idea well i think uh, it's a wave uh, what we've observed is that initially say in the 60s absolutely everybody wanted to be an engineer talk of 70s and 80s everybody wanted to get into information technology so the next wave i would like to inform the young generation is really space so please gear yourselves prepare yourselves to be future ready otherwise you're going to have this wave pass you by so i think that is where the future lies a lot of activity a lot of careers are going to open up in that arena and i think you must future proof yourselves and and be prepared to be relevant uh, technologically uh, in the coming years uh, well that's a, a way forward and i'm sure uh, okay we have another half an hour instead of our talking let's uh, listen to them eh? if you have any questions or clarification please come forward and i will get to the bike sir i do feel the privilege to be here to uh, hear you uh, i am a uh, i am a professor with university i teach urdu literature i teach ekbal when i am teaching ekbal i am referring your name why because ekbal's poetry has traveled into a space how 
Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi has questioned you, Mr. Rakesh, how India is looking from there. In reply, uh, you told that Sare Jahan Se Acha Hindustan Hamara, then I want its confirmation, sir, please. <laughs> I gave you the reason why I said what I said, because I was speaking the truth. She asked me, how does India look from there? And I told her, it's the best site there is. And of course, I was using uh, Mamad Iqbal's uh, eternal words, because it, it, it describes India perfectly, and I stand by that today. So India certainly looks beautiful from space. How to make it more beautiful, more relevant, it's up to all of us. How to make it, you know, in, not only in visually, not only visually, but substantially. Well, I would like to add, uh, I'm on the ground, I've not gone to space. But uh, seeing the pictures from space, plenty of them. But more than that, the ground reality. You see, last uh, several years, the transformation which has taken place in the country. Beautiful highways have come in place, and uh, many of the cities which are uh, heap of uh, uh, garbage, it has been cleaned up. Uh, they look so beautiful. And more than that, you look at the paddy fields, the wheat fields, and the type of agriculture, the forestry, what we are having, the, uh, all these things are, you know, uh, really unique. And we have grown substantially in those areas. So certainly, I can also vouch that the Sade Jahan Seacha, in many respects, not only in the practical natural phenomena, but also in industries, in our economic condition, living standards, and so on. If I may come back to your question and Muhammad Iqbal's immortal poem, I would urge each one of us here to read the words of the entire poem. And it is so meaningful, and it is so inspirational, and I think if we can follow that, we, all of us together, will be transforming the country. Good afternoon, sir. Earlier, you were talking about how we have to go and explore other planets. But right now, looking at how Earth is the environment and how global warming and things like that are going on, uh, don't you think we should first see it is our responsibility. We are all like part of the mess. So don't you think we should like fix the mess first over here and then think about exploring like that amount of money and everything that we can use? where you, uh, nations can come together and do something, isn't it better we do something here first? And because isn't it selfish of us that we are here, we've ruined Earth enough, and like we are <laughs> concerned about humanity, but also there are other species, everything on Earth. And it's, don't, do you think it's fair that we ruin Earth and then we find our way through to Moon or Mars or wherever, but what about Earth? <laughs> No, yeah, that's, I think that's a very good question. And uh, the way I would answer it is that uh, it's a fact that we have ruined uh, planet Earth and we've done an exceptionally good job and we continue to do so. Uh, but, th but there is a learning, you know, from all this as to how we should look at development. Sustainable development should be our aim, not just development. If you focus only on development, then all these problems occur. The, the, uh, the consumption of uh, natural resources, which is not sustainable, the pollutants which we are putting into, uh, to, which is driving climate change into the atmosphere. So here is a model, when we go to settle outside, of planet Earth, these are the learnings we must take with us. And the mistakes that we've made here, we shouldn't make there. But to answer your question whether we should first fix Earth before we go, I believe that the way technology is galloping today, 
we cannot afford to do things sequentially. We have to do things parallelly and learn to not to make the same mistakes that we have earlier made. So that is our opportunity to improve on what we have already done badly. Yes, it must go on parallelly. And like he said just now, the changes are occurring. People are thinking different. But what do you do if, if Trump withdraws from the climate change <laughs> protocol? You know, so that is awareness is what we, will ne we need to build up. We need to recognize, we need to go back and get back in touch with our old culture where we used to worship nature. I think that's what we need to do and that is what will make this planet Earth sustainable and we'll be able to live here long enough. Oh, in fact, uh, space is doing a lot of, uh, uh, what you call, work for maintaining the environment. See, if you look at the space platform from which we are getting continuous images, the multi-spectral bands and so on. So from there, we were able to precisely identify the extent of ice melt which is taking place in the poles, the extent of warming taking place on the ocean, and also the carbon and so on. There are spacecraft which is going around which can pick up the carbon dioxide component in the atmosphere, the dust component in the atmosphere, aerosols and so on. So these are all the, the, the result of our own. Now once we know that these things are happening and where is the origin and how it propagates, propagation is by the natural phenomena. But now the origin, if we know, we can attack those. See, for example, all of us uh, now realize that the burning of uh, haze in the uh, Punjab or Haryana region, etc., that is the one thing which contributes to the fog in the Delhi and other metros and so on. So probably we have tackled the source. So like that, you know, we get, derive a lot of information out of that. Again, in uh, maintaining the forest. You know, the, the greenery is a good uh, thing for carbon. So that we have to encourage. But unfortunately, quite often these things uh, remain on paper. People don't implement that. They become emotional rather than practical in implementing many of the corrective actions. The scientific study based on the global uh, look at the planet Earth is helping us to tackle this uh, climate change problem in a much bigger way. Uh, hi, good afternoon, sir. Happy birthday to you. You are such an inspiration to the entire mankind, and it's an honor to meet you. So my question is regarding the youth attraction. You may speak. Am I audible? I didn't catch, I didn't catch that. Okay, Could youth that? attraction. See, in NASA in Florida, you can go there and visit the spacecraft. They even give you an experience, the launch in a simulator. You might be knowing that. But why ISRO hasn't opened its door to the commoner? Thank you. Well, we have only one launch complex, and uh, they are busy with uh, pushing up the rockets uh, almost every month now. Now, the point is, uh, it's a, a secure area. Some hazards can take place, etc. Uh, so we have to have the safety measures, everything in place. And only limited people can be there in the launch site. Earlier, we were not doing that. But now, ISRO has opened up, and uh, selected groups of students uh, in the space week, they are allowing them to go to the space centers. And also, recently, uh, some two or three students have been taken for the launch and so on. But you know, India is a large country with about uh, maybe about uh, th 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 sorry, 300 crore people want to see that. But we cannot tackle all those things. But on a selective basis, certainly we can do that. So those people who want to get into space arena, they have to go through some of these. Uh, quiz competition or essay competition which is what uh, uh, ISRO conducts in the space week. And those who come toppers in that, they will be exposed to these facilities and the launch. But more than that, every launch is televised. The DD National, half an hour before a launch event, live you can see the ISRO's launch from Sri This no other country does it. So uh, I would respectfully disagree with you slightly. The reason being, I think we must recognize the fact that we live 
in a media-driven society today. And by nature, we do not like to beat our chests and beat our drum saying that we have done such a great job. Fact is, ISRO is a shining light of success technologically compared to all other organizations in India. But it is hiding its light under a bushel. It has not leveraged the media to explain the intricacies, the successes, which are, these are the visual images or the experiential uh, learnings which the youth will get by actually smelling the kerosene during launch, shall we say. Uh, and this will leave a lasting impact. It's a, it's a very good suggestion. Uh, I think Dr. Sivan other day was uh, discussing with this topic. Soon we will have an ISRO channel, a dedicated science channel uh, for the space activities, and uh, that will be coming up. Uh, un until it is launched, you know, I cannot uh, commit for that. I, we will do it soon. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Sir, it's absolute honor meeting you both, sir. Sir, it's uh, our childhood dreams to meet you people. So my question is that you have said Sare Jahan Se Achha Hindustan Amara and it's deeply engraved in us, sir. I would tell my next generation that Rakesh Ji said this to our next uh, P, our Honorable PM at that time. So my question is, when would we truly become Sare Jahan Se Achha in terms of uh, the space research uh, type? Like we would be above NASA. People would say, yeah, it's throw above NASA in one breath. Well, uh, difficult comparison. See, we don't want to compare with others. We must have our own goals. See, for example, Dr. Sarabhai, when he started the program in the 60s, he said, we should be able to be self-reliant in this high technology. Use this technology for the benefit of the common. We did that. In fact, in 2005, we took a all India level review, high level committee and all, and every a dream or uh, actions what they listed, we have completed. Now, what next? That we have talked about a program. In that, one of the important elements is the man. Then comes the recoverable and reusable launch system, which will uh, reduce the cost of access to space, and so on. So, we have our own path defined, and uh, we are on the right track now, and got such good we have been successful too. Uh, our launch vehicles have shown to the world we can have better than 95 percent. Whether NASA, Russia, and all when they started, they were hardly 60 percent, 70 percent. So we have really established a benchmark. Now we have to go a long way forward. We will, we will do it in time, and uh, maybe I don't know. If space continues. I am also hopeful we will have our own at least a robotic exploration of Mars by to Yeah, I but think uh, just to add to what Sir has said, really, we must go our own way. That's what we have been doing up till now. And there's no competition. Competition kills you. You want to ape and improve and become better than somebody. What next? Here, if you do your own thing, you can keep raising the benchmark every time you achieve the previous self-imposed uh, benchmark. And I think that's the way to go. And uh, if you recall, almost every prime minister when he's speaking on a world stage has referred to our national ethos, which is Kutumbakam, yeah, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. That we are all one. And what ISRO has done for the common Indian people, wouldn't it be nice if India does for the region? And then that ripple will move out and finally, indeed, space technology can be leveraged for the greater good of humanity. Then only will peace prevail on Earth and then everybody will say, this is ISRO's model, India's model. We have made a very small beginning in that, uh, a communication satellite which is useful by the SAR countries. 
that is the first step which you have put forward. So that you can cover entire uh, South Asian region and other nations as well can benefit out of this. Yes, happy birthday, sir. Uh, Thank uh, you. Good afternoon. Actually, I am very much um, happy to uh, be in front of you, so near to you. I am not uh, able to say that of infinity, but you are the person who, say, who spake in poetry. Uh, an astronaut who spake in poetry, Sare Jehan Se Acha. So that time we were rejoicing in streets and we are telling to our generations that, see, this is uh, an astronaut who spake in poetry. So uh, uh, at that time we were that much uh, national, that nationalism was in our veins, blood, everything. But what do you say about the imposing nationality nowadays going on this India? Uh, really, you should stand up in theater, you should see this, see this. What, why this country is doing this to us, sir? Because next question, we are that much ahead in uh, uh, this uh, um, space, then why we are breaking coconuts when we are launching uh, rockets? Thank you, sir. Ma'am, you have asked an astronaut a political question. You will get a much better answer if you ask a politician a scientific question. Of course, it's a political question. It is a political question. Sir, sir, let's not let's not reduce this. Uh, meeting to a slugfest. Okay, so Sir, uh, what, uh, what specifically do you want to know from me? You want to bring Please it back to the fact with that... Your question. Who's this? Who's speaking? So go uh, good afternoon, sir. I have a small question. Uh, sir, I teach science and mathematics to 60 high school students. Let me please finish with that answer first. Right. I'll come to you. So specifically, what is your question? That the money being utilized is not correct? What is the question actually? You want me to comment? Who, who, who is electing the kind of politicians we have? You and I. Uh, who's elected? I'm not elected. All of us are elected. So you will get the government you deserve. All right? Not you, all of us. This is all our common problem. Okay, all of us say that there should be no corruption. Okay, but we are the first guys who will pay the cop. Everybody says, you know, this place must be clean. We are the first guys who will throw a wrapper from our car. It is us. Of course it is not right. Of course it is not right. And who's going to make it right? Don't keep wait, exactly, we, we. Yeah, so that's no question, that's a statement. Let's See, not make uh, this an about argument. The, about the starvation, you must know that India is producing food grains much more than the country needs. We are exporting. Now, the whole problem comes, as uh, Rakesh has pointed out, because of our system. We are not able to acquire and distribute it in an equitable manner. So who is responsible for that? You know. Next question. Okay, we have to change that system. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, all right, good afternoon, sir. I teach 60 high school students science and mathematics, and uh, they are first generation learners, most of them SC, ST, OBC, and they are passionate about science and mathematics. But uh, I understand that for these families, education is a means of coming out of their economic situation. So uh, it is extremely unviable for me to suggest, for me to encourage. I don't know. They want to be astronauts. They want to be scientists. But a career in the pure sciences is so far away for them. It is not profitable. Moreover, the lack of clarity about such a career is going to discourage them from pursuing that uh, as against other things. Why do you think that's the case? And what do you think as a country, as a so civil society, what do you think we should do to encourage these children to pursue pu uh, pure sciences? Uh, there, is, there are a lot of schemes. 
by which the students are encouraged to take up the higher studies in the science and technology or in the space and so on. But in all these fields, nothing else counts other than merit. So you should know the, your fundas strongly, you should be able to communicate properly and appear to the competitive test which is happening. Uh, the, uh, I must point out to you one thing, national level they have declared something like uh, 5,000 scholarships for the science education. Those who offer the science stream and uh, have got a good placement, uh, they were, uh, their entire educational expense will be borne by the government up to PhD level. So whether you come from a poor family or urban family is immaterial. So it's only the merit which is going to count. So if you are serious about it, pursue some of this program. Uh, space, if you want to get in, after plus two, you should uh, join the Space Science and Technology Institute at Tiruvannadapuram. There again, it's a competitive. You appear for the JEE, if you have got a good rank, you will get there. So there is a free India and everyone has got an equal opportunity. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, happy birthday to you, uh, sir. Uh, we are honored to have you here. My question is to Dr. Nair. Uh, Dr. Nair, you uh, were at the forefront. I mean, you headed uh, uh, the Indian Space Research Organization and you were, uh, you spearheaded uh, Chandrayaan. But uh, I find a paradox now. You know, you have joined a party uh, a couple of months back which has the audacity, the leader, I mean, uh, you, and there you said you were fascinated by the development agenda of uh, uh, the leader, Mr. Modi. And he is the person who has the audacity to spend 3,000 crores on a statue, okay? And, you know, and uh, uh, then he uh, professes uh, pseudoscience. He says uh, 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 Lord Ganesha is the uh, example of plastic surgery having, uh, in ex having been in existence in India from prehistorical times or whatever nonsense it is. So isn't that doesn't, uh, hasn't that sent a wrong message to the youth of the country when a scientist acclaimed, accomplished scientist like you, you know, join a, uh, joins a party like that? Well, uh, first let me clarify, I'm not an active politician. Certainly, I, I will tell, come, I'll come to that. Uh, one thing, you look at what the country has achieved today. We have sustained growth of 7.5% plus in the economic front. That, that, let, me, let me complete. Let me complete. Then, then we have, you look at the, uh, you know, earlier we were mentioning that people are starving and things like that. How to remove the power, uh, how to make sure people get the food grains. The schemes announced by the government are very unique. If you are below the poverty line, you will get ration delivered at your house. Third, about uh, farmers, the minimum price is guaranteed. They were selling potatoes at 50 paise or onions at 2 paise and so on. So those people will get the guaranteed price on the gap will be given by the government. So such schemes are very unique and forward-looking. It's not only looking at the rich people, but looking at the plight of the poor as well. So that is what attracted me to the leader. Uh, well, I think any system we introduce will take a little bit of time to stabilize. You see the next cropping season, you will find a better result. Anyway, I don't want to get into a political uh, debate at this stage. This is a <laughs> Thank you, sir. Next.